education is a lot of work, uh, whether it's you know, students going through grades 1 to 8 or 1 to 12, um, Bible Institute kind of studies. Uh, it's a lot of work to do it, a lot of work to manage it. And today we're going to have a conversation uh, exploring why. Why is that uh, worth it? Our guest is Paul Emerson, and Paul has been involved in both uh, various um, day schools as well as other forms of Christian education, uh, Bible Institute, and things like that. So excited to welcome him to Anabaptist Perspectives. If our conversations can just kind of range over both of these, um, but let's start with the Bible Institute you're involved with, um, Elnora Bible Institute, and maybe just frame what's the overarching goal or purpose. I would say the overarching goal is uh, spiritual formation for primarily directed to young people, 18 and older. We do have some older students from time to time. I guess the oldest we've had as a full-time student would have been 68, maybe. But typically, it's uh, the young people. Uh, when people hear about uh, Bible Institute, some people think uh, the social uh, component is the main one. Uh, that is not how we feel. We feel that the biblical uh, component is the main one. And so we're looking for the impact of Scripture on the life of the student. So, yeah, scripturally intensive um, focus. Um, is there a social part of that, though? I mean, if you especially include having live instructors and so on. Yeah, there's there's a social component. Relationships are built. Uh, faculty to student, student to faculty, student to student, uh, certainly. And then there are what we might call purely social times uh, for the typical Anabaptist game time for part of an evening. I guess we could think of those effects, too, in terms of the student's life. You said spiritual formation. Um, what do you want them to get from Bible school? And is that also a piece that translates back to, this is the church community. I want to enrich the church community by maybe mostly training individual people. Yeah, we would see ourselves as coming alongside churches and helping them in these ways. Uh, we would feel that it's uh, an opportunity, uh, young persons away from home, opportunity for, the, to them, for them to examine themselves to see whether they be in the faith, as the Scripture says. And so we kind of start out with the gospel. I'm not uh, doubting that they may have heard it uh, in their churches and may have committed to Christ but still wanting to be sure that we all understand the gospel in its full sense. And that's because you don't want to take anything for granted. I think the biggest error that we can make probably in this, in this part of our ministry is to assume that someone is saved. I think our better assumption or our default position should be we will assume that they're not saved until they prove otherwise. Uh, do you want to say anything about some of the other things you do at the Bible Institute that aren't just for young people? Um, maybe some of the seminars you run for pastors or whatever. Yes, we have seminars for um, ministry, uh, training, pastoral kinds of things. And also uh, there's a seminar each year on uh, expository preaching. Uh, we also have uh, a discipleship seminar, otherwise known as biblical counseling. Uh, these are week-long uh, type of meetings in the fall. It's, again, a way we come alongside of the church and encourage ministry and others in various ministry opportunities within their church. Yeah. No, I, I like that model because it's very hard for somebody, somebody in the stage of life that a church leader is usually in. It's very hard for them to take 15 weeks or six weeks and do an intensive course, but if it's packaged in a week and you can speak right where they are. Yeah, let's really shift a little bit to um, educating children uh, more broadly, the K-12 to education. Yeah, we talk about goals and so on. Um, 
you want to just tell us a little bit maybe about your ex- summarize a little bit the experience you had um, with that to start with? I suppose it started when I was young in terms of an interest in education. My mother was a public school teacher who uh, left off her teaching when she had children. Uh, in the process, uh, left us a bit of a, a heritage with view to getting involved in education in some way. Uh, that that bore fruit after I became a minister, and uh, with with the idea of of uh, starting uh, a church controlled uh, Christian school. And so I was first involved in that in 1975 and have been involved variously ever since in some aspect of education. But we would see the primary responsibility for education of children uh, resting on the parents. But we do see the importance of the community being involved, the community of faith, that is to say the local church, either for accountability if uh, the parents choose homeschool or uh, for actually providing education as an extension of the home in a a Christian school setting. The reason for primary education and secondary education in our thinking is is, uh, not so that they can get a good job, or even so that they can go to college, though a number of them will go to college. Uh, The reason is to prepare them to be trained uh, in reading, understanding, being able to understand the scriptures and apply the scriptures in daily life. In other words, it is more the idea that they are... uh, preparing to serve in the kingdom uh, with the ultimate goal of doing that with heavenly or eternal view, with a view to eternity and what really will matter and what will be here a million years from now or what what they'll be experiencing a million years from now rather than just the immediate uh, 40 or 50 years that's ahead of them. Yeah, I got several follow-ups to that. They just... I'm just curious though, you said 1975, did you have, was that like legally difficult to start a school then? I know the, have been a little bit the earlier days, the Christian school movement, was that, or did you have smooth sailing as far as the government was concerned? Well, we were living in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts at the time, uh, and there were court cases all over the place uh, re- regarding Christian schools and and the homeschool movement actually was beginning just in that time period. And uh, those parents were not particularly godly parents. They were not particularly Christian. They were actually uh, professors at uh, the University of Massachusetts, which was nearby. Uh, they were immediately prosecuted for uh, contributing to the delinquency of a minor by violating the truancy laws. And so uh, they had much deeper pockets than we did, and as a result, they actually uh, paved the way for a certain amount of appropriate liberty in Christian education. Uh, for us, though, I'm sure they did that unintentionally. However, we did run afoul of a uh, of, of part of the state code at one point, which managed to get my picture on the front of the local newspaper and so forth. Uh, we never were involved legally the uh, state ended up working with us to kind of bypass their own regulations uh, to permit us to go forward with the school. Yeah, and that kind of thing has gotten a lot easier over the years legally, although we don't know how long that will last. It certainly could change. Yeah, back to uh, purpose. Just thinking a couple things there. Yeah, so learning to read the scriptures, and that's been a a Christian theme all along. Teach lots of people to read so they can read the Bible. Um, I guess I could hear somebody say, yeah, but we learn to read the scriptures by, you know, we learn to read by the time we're in third grade, second, third grade. 
Um, why do we need high school and Bible Institute? And again, that's not my perspective, but I can see the point too. Well, you learn to read, then hey, the rest of it can take care of itself. So why would you have uh, a uh, literature course in college and university? Uh, why would you study genre and all of that and advanced studies? Learning to read may not be learning to read with understanding. And I'm not saying that scripture cannot be understood by a child. It, it can be. But there is a sense in which it is, as, uh, as it says, new every morning. Uh, and some of that is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit and interpretation. But some of it also is understanding the depths of uh, the language in which it is written. And, and so I think that's a lifelong study. And formal education contributes to it. Yes, and I have certainly found that true in my life. But it's learning to read, as in, you know, sounding out the words and looking up the words. And then there's learning to read, as in, okay, actually thoughtfully engage with what the author is saying. Uh, most importantly, scripture. And what about schools and Christian character? Because I get this sometimes from the Christian school movement, and I I think I mostly agree, but it always brings up questions when it's like, well, our primary role of the school is, you know, we provide examples and we form Christian character and academics are secondary or something like that. And I guess there's two things. One is I think the academics are important. But secondly, I'm left wondering, well, wait, if we're about forming character, is school actually the place to do that? Or is, um, is that something done at home? I don't know. How do you think about schools as character formation? I would think that is probably secondary. Don't get me wrong. I feel that uh, character development is very important and character reinforcement or good character reinforcement. Uh, and we would want our Christian schools to uh, contribute to that. But I would see it more in the realm of reinforcement. Uh, I think too many times parents will send their children to a Christian school, perhaps because they haven't done a very good job themselves in character development of these children. They expect the school to fix them. And that is a terrible mistake. Uh, and the school needs to be pretty careful in accepting that situation. They should, they should dig around in the application process and come to understand what the parents really expect. Because if the parents expect the school to fix their mistakes, uh, it's going to be one error piled on another and will negatively affect the whole school. That's interesting because just last week I had a conversation with a yeah, school leader where our children are going and the same conversation came about the importance of the family interview because it's like, well, is the family doing things in a way that this is actually not a school, but it's a uh, homeschooling support organization you know, that we as a organization can effectively partner with them. If there's not enough coming from home, they're like, well, we, we can't really work with them. We need to know our parents and develop the partnership. I think that uh, the Christian school can be very helpful in building community and helping uh, children understand the dynamics of community, particularly um where there's not a, a broad church community uh, of children the same age. There are things that school can do sociologically, if I can put it that way, but uh, the school is going to be limited uh, in what it can do when the home is not doing what it biblically is required to do. So then my last question, and then I'll give you the opportunity if you have um, any other places you'd like to think thoughts you'd like to share, but, um, just how important is it to do, you know, distinctively Christian education in terms of organizing the schools? Obviously, if you're doing a Bible institute and teaching the Bible, um, but that general learning to read, like, why organize our own schools versus, you know, using public options or private school options, um, going to a secular university to study genre, genre and things like that. 
Um, how do you think about that? Well, personally, I'm committed to Christian education, biblical Christian education, uh, and this is why. Uh, I think that the world in uh, any given instance may be more intelligent than we. I think that's sort of suggested for in First Corinthians. So we're not talking about intelligence. Uh, we're talking about worldview. How do we view the world? Uh, and the secularist views it in an entirely different worldview than we do to the point where I think we can apply a scripture that says that they don't know anything as they ought to know it. Uh, they know lots of things. They may be more intelligent than we, uh, and probably are in many cases, uh, but they don't know anything as they ought to know it, in other words, from a Christian biblical worldview. And those anti-biblical worldviews, which I would kind of lump all together, um, are infectious. Uh, we are influenced by our environment, academically particularly, because it's a matter of the mind, and therefore I would see it's very important to have a biblical, formal biblical education, Bible-based Christian education uh, at all levels. It may, it may be elusive at the higher education level. Uh, but by the time you're at higher education, uh, you're a little more equipped than a child, uh, so things are a little different. Yes, if we've done our job as churches and communities anyhow, yeah, help equip people at that level. Yeah, it's good to flush it out. Um, this ac episode actually kind of stems from a lunch table conversation we had a number of years ago. I remember asking you about something about though, you know, why you're involved in education. And there you gave the very, very direct answer. Well, God doesn't put, I don't think God puts a premium on ignorance. Anything else you'd like to say in closing on this episode? I uh, reflect on Colossians chapter two, where it presents the fact that Christ is the fountainhead of all wisdom and knowledge. In essence, education is Christology in some form or other. Uh, I, I, would, I would take that from the text or apply that from the text. And then church involvement would be a subset of that. And uh, 1 Timothy 3, uh, I believe it's verse 16, 15 or 16 talks about the church as the buttress. Again, it's foundational for truth. That's stretching it just a bit out of the context. He's talking about church uh, order and so on there. Uh, but still, I think that the church needs to be involved coming alongside of parents with children and uh, coming alongside of any effort uh, at education, such as the Bible Institute. Uh, the church is the part of God's program that uh, gives some regulation, some accountability, and that sort of thing. So that that is how I view education in general. And that applies whether you're interacting with a private school or home school or educational levels. It may not be directly done by, you know, the church, the organized church, but it's accountable to. Thank you for joining us for this episode. We invite you to join our monthly partner program. Monthly partners are key to the financial sustainability of Anabaptist perspectives. Partners also gain access to bonus content, including our exclusive podcast where we respond to audience questions and comments. Sign up at anabaptistperspectives.org. <laughs>